Had you ever a task to do and no idea how to even start? Well, I would like to share with you how I recently tackled a real client's problem and what mistake I made. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Johannes Frey, but you can simply call me Joe and I've been working as a software engineer for more than 15 years and I'm here to share the few little things that I picked up along the way. I was recently contacted by a startup company that I did some gig with about two years ago. So usually I'd like to take on bigger clients, but every now and then I also uh, like to squeeze in some smaller clients and startups because I find it sometimes refreshing working with those. With those bigger projects, it's usually the case that you work as part of a bigger team uh, long term and those smaller ones, it's usually like the Navy SEALs, it's quick in, quick out. And um, they have a specific problem that needs to be solved right now. And just because they currently don't have the manpower themselves or they don't have the experience in this area, that's why they are then looking for someone to help them. And so the startup had the task to split up two web services running on the same virtual server and make them run on two different virtual machines and make it so that those two web services could still communicate via REST. It sounded like a clear and defined goal and so I agreed to squeeze it in. And even though this task is mainly infrastructure related, the approach also applies more generally. Basically, the first thing that you want to do when starting on a client's task is to get as many information as possible. So for this, we did set up a call to discuss the technical specifics and answer any questions that I might have. It's often a struggle to get the information I need out of a client and that also comes back a bit later to bite me in the butt. The client spends every day working on their project and so many things are obvious for them that are not so obvious for me who just starts working on that project. And so clients often forget to mention specific things and I need to watch out for that and ask as many questions as I can. For me, the important thing during this call is to get a good idea about the architecture and the ideas behind the system that I'm working on, since I want to make sure to follow those as good as I can. Also, here are some other questions that I like to ask. I like to ask about a clear and defined target because I want to know when I'm done with the work. And the next one is important and might not be obvious, but I also need to know how to test whether I achieve my target or not. So I need to ask for that as well. Then of course the obvious like logins and permissions and I need to make sure to be specific and help the client out if I can or if I notice that he might forget something. Another important question to ask the client is the client's preferred way to how to get in touch with them when questions arise. And I'm quite sure that questions will arise. By the way, don't forget to make notes during the call because if the call goes on for some time, it's quite easy to forget some important information that has been mentioned during the call. After the call, I had a good understanding of those two services, their environment and how they communicate and had answers to all the other questions. Especially, I had an answer for the question about how to test that everything works and that I was successful. The client told me that there is a web app that displays the version number of those two web services. So when the versions for those two web services show up in the web app, then I can be sure that everything works. So then I got access to the client's GitHub repository and AWS account and could start doing my work. Okay, that was the easy part, but now I need to get some work done. But where to start? Situations like this can be quite overwhelming. You have a client that depends on you. You have a whole code base that you've seen the last time, like two years ago, sometimes never before. And now you need to find a way to somehow make sense out of all of that and actually achieve your goal. What I did next is to have a look at the code, trying to figure out what parts are relevant for the task and I made notes along the way. If there is another source besides the code that I could check out, I would also do that. Since this specific task was very infrastructure heavy, I also logged in into the AWS console and looked around there as well. For my notes, I don't use anything super fancy. I just use my iPad and some note-taking app so that I can quickly note some things down and draw some diagrams if required. But obviously, pen and paper will do the job just fine. Since the current task involves changing the infrastructure architecture, I made a diagram showing the different infrastructure components and their connections between each other. Also, I created a to-do list while getting familiar with the system. The goal here is to break the task down into smaller and better understandable subtasks. Okay, now that I have a better idea, it's time to get to actually making some changes to the code. And for some people, that might be intimidating because of the fear of breaking things. 
I made sure with the client upfront that it is in fact a development system that I'm working on and that I'm allowed to break things. And I would encourage you to do the same as well. If this is the case, most of the times you don't need to be too cautious because if you completely mess up, you can always revert back the code base to the point where you started with the version control system that the client is using. And I really hope that the client is using a version control system. At this point, it's basically just working off my to-dos that I made earlier and consulting my notes every now and then when I'm not sure about something. There is one thing worth mentioning though. When I'm working on such a gig, I want to make sure to change as little as possible. The reasoning for this is that since I'm not a permanent member of the team, I don't want to cause any friction. And since the other developers are already familiar with the code base, I don't want to change too much. Also, maybe the client doesn't want those changes and then you have worked for nothing and need to revert the changes in the end. If there are any improvements that I would like to make that are not directly related to the task at hand, I make sure to note them down somewhere so that I can propose them to the client later on. At some point, I thought I was done. There were no more errors in the logs that indicated that service one couldn't see service two, but still the indicator in the web app was not showing the service two that I extracted. And at this point, I realized that I made a stupid mistake and didn't even ask what needs to happen to update the indicator in the web app. Is it polling every X time? Do I need to restart web app so that it updates? What exactly is the indicator even checking for? I was a bit bummed out that I overlooked that somewhat obvious question and accepted the answer, yeah, there is an indicator, without digging deeper and asking about the specifics for this indicator. So I had to reach out to the client and basically let down my pants and admit my oversight. And as it turns out, of course, it wasn't just a matter of, eh, you need to restart X, but of, oh yeah, it's not just the case that service one needs to be able to connect to service two, like I assumed, but the other way around needs to be there as well. It turns out that service one is also exposing a REST API that service two needs to be able to query. And this, was, and this behavior wasn't mentioned by anyone before, and so I had to reconsider my solution, which again involved changes to the infrastructure, and so I needed to rework the things that I had done before. And at first glance, that might not seem like a biggie, but because of the back and forth with the client, waiting for emails, and the reworking of things, it made the whole task take much longer than it needed. Which sucks for you as a freelancer, because you want to get things done and focus on the next thing, and also, it sucks for the client because the client seems to have some pain that with the current situation and wanted to change. And usually the client wants that ASAP. At this point, I scheduled another call with the client to walk him through the changes that I made. And more importantly, to walk him through the things that I was thinking while coming up with the solution so that the client is able to maintain the code that I have written. I hope that this short real-life freelancing story was interesting and helpful for you. If you would like more freelancing content, check out the playlist here. And it would be also super awesome if you could go completely nuts on that like button. That would really help me out so far. See you in the next one.